Good morning and a happy Sabbath to all our viewers this morning. We want to thank God for yet another day. Uh, we greet you wherever you are watching us from. Thank you for joining us this morning. This, this is our Sabbath school lesson. And this morning, I'm joined by my two elders, Elder Jared Manyara and Elder Joel Opere. This is a continuation of our ongoing series that we've been looking at, the new Sabbath school lesson that is managing for the master till he comes. And last week, we looked at the... The contract of tithing and this morning and and, and 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 just as we say the contract of tithing that was a command tithing is a command from god and this week we want to look at offerings for jesus and and we want to just see what's the difference between tithe and offering and how do we handle both of this this morning and before we start i'll request elder jared to please pray for us uh, let's pray our heavenly father we want to thank you once again this morning for your mercy is upon us, you have woken us up, and you have brought us here, Lord. How we pray that as we worship you, Lord, that you accept our worship. Lord, even as we are going to study this lesson today on offerings, how we pray, Lord, that you guide us until we come to the end for this humble prayer in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I forgot to say that my name is Matthew Drew, a member of this church, and I'll be facilitating this session this morning. So this week... Uh, we, our, our memory text comes from uh, Psalms 116, verse 12 uh, to 14. And the Bible says, What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take up the cup of salvation and I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. And as we look at this morning, we've said this morning we're looking at offerings for Jesus. And we're told besides tithing, there are offerings that come from the 90%. Remember last week we talked about 10% of, our, of, of all our increase in our income that is, belongs to God. It is holy and consecrated to God. So it belongs to God and it should never be used. We should never use that. But the Lord leaves us with 90%. Of this 90% of that which is left to our possession, we are told that the Lord is looking at us to, to, to give an offering of this. And this is about generation it's about generosity there are different types of offerings they are sin offerings that are given in response to god's grace they are thank offerings given in recognition of god's protection his blessings for health prosperity and sustaining power and there is also offerings for the poor and offerings to build and maintain the house of worship so this is what we call a free will offering so as we look at this week, our, 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 we bring our offerings in response to what God has done for us, and especially in response to the gift of Jesus Christ. So, Elder Opera, this morning, we talk about motivations of giving. Why do we give an offering? What for you would you say should motivate us to give? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sister Masi and Elder uh, Manyara. I think as we are looking at this, um, conversing on this um, um, subject on managing for the master something just to bring congruency and uh, connection with some of the uh, issues we looked at we looked at as being members of the god's family what is required as, uh, of us as god's family then we looked at covenant with us that god has a covenant with us as members of his family uh, god has a covenant with us then now of salvation something which is very great then we found last week we looked at the tithing contract and we looked at that contract there's covenants which are unilateral there are some which are bilateral the unilateral ones which god just do for us like the sunshine the rainfall we have nothing to do in it but then there are those ones which we have obligation to do like now the tithing we are told it is a command that is a contract which we have no escape unless and we found that obedience when we give tithe there is an element of obedience because god has commanded but now we are looking at something which is now beyond the command where we are now given free will and i remember we were conversing with elder manyara and sister Irene last time that uh, we wonder God only asks of 10, uh, how is managing the mini, mini missionary work with the 10 
while we are crying when we are remaining with 90. <laughs> and we are wondering <laughs> then that. <laughs> but now, when we come to offering for Jesus, the question which I remember when last week people asking, what about this offering? What should I give? What should uh, this 90 which has remained? Then how do we go about it? I think today it is a very good thing. Then, and as we had read in 116 verse 12 that, What shall I render? David is asking to the Lord for all his goodness to us. That is the question which should uh, bring us to the, uh, the, the big question. How much then should I give out of the 90? I think to respond to this question explicitly, one, is first of all understand, as we have understood in the past, that one, everything is God's. Including you and me, we are God's. So, the 10% he has commanded us, then he has given us another 90% to remain with. Then the question is, do we give 5 out of that 90, so we remain with uh, 85? Or do we give 10, we remain with 80? Or how much then do we give? I think the question, the answer we, is what has been given to us. David has said that the question which David asked, what then should motivate us? The Bible has told us, Christ first loved us. He first loved us. Meaning, heaven gave everything which it had for to us or for our salvation. Then we should ask ourselves, starting from that, if heaven gave everything it had for us, therefore what should we give? I think the greatest question answer should be, we should be motivated by God's love. It should be in response to God's ama amazing gift of Jesus Christ to us. In many times we usually say, according to the measure of your faith and ability. According to the measure of your faith and ability. You know, uh, Sister Mercy, you can be married, I know you're married to Elder Amos, but you may not be at the same level of giving. And so, there is no need to compare yourself or push yourself. Sometimes, we, you might be at different levels of faith. How uh, I've experienced, my experience with God may be, different, may be different with my wife and God. So, what I would say, it should be in accordance to, it should be in response to God's amazing gift of Jesus Christ to me according to the measure of my faith and ability. So if you ask me, what is that measure of faith and ability? Is it 5% or it is 10% or it is not? I'm not going, we cannot, it may be very hard to quantify it in terms of percentage, but it should be how we are moved by the love of God and according to the ability and faith which we have. Thank you so much. Amen. That's really powerful. Elder Manyara, I'm wondering, and, and I was looking at, um, we have some Bible quotes here from, you know, uh, Matthew chapter 6, from verse 31 to 34, and also we have the promises of God in Deuteronomy 28, from one, verse 1 to 14. And in these promises, we're being asked, it's, it's a promise conditioned, conditioned on on, on obedience. You know, when we obey, he has promised to, to bless us in the city and bless us in the country. And, and so I'm wondering, is it selfishness to these promises of obedience, is it selfishness on our part to claim these promises from God? You know, I'm imagining if the Lord is saying, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Do you find it in any way, in, in terms of what the Lord is giving us in possession, is it, is it selfishness on our part that we are claiming these promises from God? Uh, uh, just before I respond to that, uh, and Opere has brought out something very critical on the motivation for giving. Mm. And Christ first loved us. Mm. Then <clears throat> he knows we need to appreciate mm. and gives us an opportunity to appreciate. I remember one time someone stood up in a function and told the host that <clears throat> I want 
to thank you for giving uh, me an opportunity to appreciate something good you had done for me some years back. So, when we are giving, it is an opportunity we are given to appreciate the love that Christ has given us. You can imagine of all these things that Christ has done for us, we have no outlet. It will be very, very, very disappointing. Now, here we have Matthew chapter, 30, chapter 6, verse 31 to 34. I, I could actually want us to read it because uh, it really amazed me. Matthew chapter 6. <coughs> Uh, 30, 31 to 34. <clears throat> this is what babe, the Bible says. It has been said, whoever shall put away. Sorry. No, I think. Uh, uh, I'm, says, I'm reading the wrong one. Okay, I can read it. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, okay. for, it says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Amazing. <clears throat> you can see very well here that God already has made provisions for us. We shouldn't worry like the Gentiles. Those people who do not know God, they worry about tomorrow. They worry about what they shall put on, where they can get school fees, and all these things. But the children of God should know that God knows they need them. So the first thing is that we must first seek the kingdom. Because all these others are available to us. And that's where you see that our offerings are an evidence of our willingness to sacrifice self for God. We, God must come first, not us. When we start worrying and asking God, what will happen? Now, I do not have food. What will happen? That shows an act of selfishness on your part. The thing is, you just consider God first. Uh, there's an illustration I, I always give. One time we didn't have food at home. And we asked our mom what we could, could, we could eat. And she, say, she smiled and said, my children, why are you worried? God will bring food. She trusted in God. And we also trusted in God. And actually, one hour did pass. My aunt walked in through the gate, carrying a lot of food. So, here, we are being told that we shouldn't worry. Because making an offering can be a deeply spiritual experience. An expression of the fact that our lives are wholly surrendered to God as our Lord. So, an offering comes from a heart that trusts in a personal God, who constantly provides for our needs as he sees best. So, claiming our promises, yeah, the promise that God has given is not selfish, on our part it is a demonstration of our surrender to god because he always cares for us and provides for us as per our needs thank you very much amen and unless of course our motive then is wrong unless we do not want to meet the condition of obedience and we only want to get the promise um and we thank god for that and as as, as we conclude on that part which we're looking at 
how then do we give? And, and we're told in Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and 7 that, so let each give as he has purposed in his heart. Let, and, and as Elder Opera was saying earlier, let it not be about you going to tell Mrs. Opere that I said we shall give, you know, 10% of offering. Mm -hmm. You cannot compel her because then that one is compulsion and she's feeling out of necessity. She's feeling guilt tripped by her husband to give a certain a amount of money. But you're saying let each, and in this case we're saying you elder and your wife, let each give as they have purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity, for the Lord loves a cheerful giver so that when you come here and put in that money in the basket or send it by Mpesa or, or you know do a, a transfer of your offering it is free will and that is why it's called free will as each has purposed in his own heart as the dictates of their own heart yeah and so we thank we, we, we thank God because this giving must be as an expression of love and a response of a love that we've already received and as we look at so uh, I'll come back to you Elder Jared again because what's the portion it's very clear last week when we were looking at tithe Tithe was very clearly prescribed is a tenth of your increase and of your, or your, of your income, depending on whether you know, uh, depending on how you get your income. So in this case, is there a proportion of how much should be offering? We have 90% that has been left after our tithe. Is there a proportion that God has made very clear how much we should be giving back to him? <clears throat> okay. Now, when it comes to tithe, it is a tenth. That one, everyone knows. Offerings. Because now, this is where we demonstrate our faith. Actually, uh, for tithes, it's a law. We, can, we cannot play around with it. But for offerings, it's about faith. And <clears throat> from a human point of view, I, I just want, I like using uh, our experience as humans. If you look at us as humans, when you have invited people for maybe a fundraiser to support you you have engaged these people they are those you engage as guests and you expect them to give what more <laughs> they are those who are employed you expect them to give a quite some substantial amount they are those who are not employed you expect little from them now for us as human beings God expects us to give according to the blessing that he has given us. You cannot give so little, yet God has given you so much, yeah, and yet his work is in need. God requires us to give according to the blessing that he has given us. We can find this in Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 17, mm -hmm. that you give as per the blessings that God has given you. And uh, Jesus said in uh, Luke chapter 12 verse 48. That for everyone to whom much is given. From him much will be required. So we have seen on the part of Sunday. That we must give as we are purposed in what? In our heart. In our heart. But remember, we also learned that giving is a spiritual experience. Have we surrendered to God? So that we can be able to see the much blessings he has given us. There are those who complain always they do not have. Because they cannot see the blessings of, of God. There are many other people who see the blessings of God. Like there was an example of uh, a church that was building. And people were asked to give according to the blessings God has given them. There was this man. He did not have money at all. He went uh, to the pulpit and said, please put the, be uh, the, the basin down. I want to put my offering you know, it baffled the, the elders. What is this man talking about? They, uh, but uh, they, they, they agreed. They placed the, the, basin. the basin on the ground. This man stepped inside the basin. Mm. He said, I give myself. I this is the blessing that God has given. <laughs> I give myself. Mm. So he gave himself. And they said, 
any work, any physical work that will be required in the building of this sanctuary, uh -huh. I'm available to do. Uh -huh. So he recognized the blessing. Uh -huh. So we give as per what God has given us. And in any case, sometimes uh, we say, okay, God has given me little, so let me also give what? Uh -huh. Little. But remember, the people of Macedonia gave beyond mm. what they had. Mm -hmm. So where did they get this beyond? Mm -hmm. Now, this is where we find trust in God. Amen. Yeah. So third portion that we give is according to the promise. Amen. Amen. Thank you very Amen. much. Thank you, Elder, Elder Jared. I don't know if, Elder Perry, you have anything to add on that. Yeah. Uh, that um, Deuteronomy chapter 16 verse 17 reads, Every man shall give as he is able, mm -hmm. according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given, given. you. Mm -hmm. God does not require what we do not mm -hmm. have. God requires only what he knows we mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. That is why when Moses was asked, Moses, what do you have in your hand? Mm -hmm. He said, I have a rod. That is what God used. So it means all of us, according, like I said, according to the measure of our faith and ability. You know one thing I've seen? <clears throat> there, is a, there can be a point where somebody can give tithe because it is an obligation, a command, just to fulfill the law. That Mungu amesema basi tumpatie hiyo. Because you are compelled. But even with that, I've loved the way uh, uh, Corinthians has said that God loves a cheerful giver. Even with that tithe, which we are obligated, which is a show of obedience, and now offering, which is now a show of uh, trust and faith in God, God still requires us to demonstrate faithfulness, to demonstrate appreciation, joy, and love as we do it that is why he has put that connotation a cheerful giver so that we do it cheerfully you know we can do it grudgingly and in the past weeks we realized in deuteronomy 28 that god would bless us until the blessings overtake us last week we looked at malachi chapter 3 verse 10 that i will open the floodgates but we realized we have been operating in a system where Instead of the blessings overtaking us, they are just trailing us. Instead of us being faithful so that the blessings can truly overtake us. Then it, in a sense where the floodgates can be opened, not just trickling, but can be truly opened. So even as we give according to the measure of our faith and ability, the remaining 90, God requires cheerfulness. God requires faithfulness. God requires love as we give. Because even that 90 is still God's. But he allows us to use it for our general upkeep and also to, to use it for the betterment of others. Why do I talk of faithfulness in it? It is not a license now to go and use the 90 for things which are not spiritual. Things which do not give glory and honor to God. Because it says whether you eat or drink, we know what you drink matters. So it is not a question now to go and do sin, to go and live, revel, uh, revel things which do not give glory and honor to God. Amen. I want to ask a controversial question mm -hmm. because then, and I've looked at our envelopes. Unfortunately, I don't have one, one with me right now because then we, then we are saying, because I can see even from the lesson today that we are saying, then we cannot prescribe really a portion, you know, and, and, and if you look at, if you look at um, the combination and the breakdown, it sort of shows, I'm um, not sure if this one has, this one that used to have 10% tithe, and it just sort of used to break down all these other offerings into another 10%. And I've also had, you know, conversations that I've had by people, someone saying, at all, um, during the Jewish time, I mean, like, the Israelites used to give up to 25%. So the question, can we prescribe that portion, or is that left as a free will offering, we know the different types of offerings that we need to give because the church needs to run, as we read last week, the church needs to run. There's a tithe that goes back to, you know, to the structures, but also you have, you know, uh, what we call the local church budget, which then pays for the lights, uh, which will take care of all these other costs, water bills and others. So 
uh, when when the church, for example, a local church gives a prescription and says, you know, something to, to, to the effect of another 10%, um, should we then not be doing that? Or should we leave that too for, for, for members to decide on themselves? And as I caveat that, I look at the fact that some of the times when we do a report of our giving, we see that people faithfully give tithe. Yeah, so you will see the 10% are very clear. But if you look at the, the free will offering, it's actually very low, if you've ever seen that graph that is presented to us by our finance team. So I don't know, should we then be giving this prescription? And any of you uh, can take that. I, I can yeah. respond the way Jesus responded to those people. That uh, when they asked Moses, gave them <coughs> a divorce certificate. <laughs> yes. But he told them it was because of the hardness of your heart. Us. One thing I would say... It should be a free will offering, as we had seen, motivated by the love of God. Mm. But we live in a world which has been degenerated because of sin. Because of that, we, to help people grow, people love targets. That is why targets are set to motivate people because we have degenerated to an extent that sometimes you leave people... <clears throat> to operate by free will you find that it is not there mm -hmm. so to help people to guide people so that in a way so that it can help us to be more faithful to God mm -hmm. we say okay New Life Seventh Day Adventist Church 5th Ngong Avenue the home of the Flying Marines <laughs> because we know you are most <laughs> blessed we give you a goal of this match mm -hmm. at least to inspire to motivate the people so I would not say it is sinful. No. It is a way to guide the people in a path so that people can be walk in a path that will make them to be more accountable, more faithful. Because we've realized, since we are still living under the sun, we are bound to be lazy. We are bound to take a layback position. So that is why we have to search for methodologies which are not sinful, mm. but also uh, maybe not sinful, but also just to inspire the people to help them walk the way of the Lord. So, Elder Manyara, then, in continuation to that, then can you say that your offerings and your attitude as you give them sort of show your, your relationship with Jesus Christ? Uh, definitely. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> Elder Pere pointed it out very well. It is also good to motivate giving. Um, some people may not know that they're supposed to give until someone motivates. And that's where you find the certain leaders in church. Whenever they stand, there's <laughs> giving that exceeds our needs, what we needed to give for. So it's also good to motivate. But there is this thing that I have noticed, eh? Church members need to be notified of the needs of the church. So that's why we have to identify those specific aspects of giving that we need to know that we are giving to what's church budget, we are giving to what's come meeting, something like that. So that they know what are those needs. So that even as we prepare to give that free will offering, eh, we can have at the back of our mind what needs the church has. And then we can see how much we can give. In fact, that's why sometimes you find some people go to the extent of saying, uh, because we have to do that, I've given my whole month salary. Mm. Yeah? You can imagine, eh? Someone has given their whole 90% eh? to God because it will be notified of the church or uh, church needs. There's something also I've noted eh? <coughs> um, <coughs> a number of times. Many of us think that when we have given the tithe, we have met all the church needs. And I've seen, I, 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 see, I sit in the church board, for not for one year, but I've sat for many years. Sometimes uh, an issue is presented, which requires financing. Then you hear people saying, let the church take that up. <laughs> so, now the question is, from what source? So that's why we have to notify the church members of the needs. Then there's something you pointed out. Tithe given faithfully. Free will offerings adopt. Many times, 
uh, it's about the background. Uh, and let me be honest. In the past, we were being taught that if you do not give tithe, you will be cursed. Mm -hmm. So to avoid the curse, mm -hmm. you have to be faithful in what? <laughs> in tithing. Then the other thing, upon tithe, a blessing is pronounced. Mm -hmm. As we read in Malachi 3.10. So we know that if you give tithe, the floodgates will be what? Open. Opened. We forget that the same God who gives blessings because of tithe is the same God who will give blessings on the basis of what? Offerings. The offerings that we have. So it is incumbent upon us as a church that we continue learning and continue educating one another. That it's not only on the tithing that God blesses. He also blesses us on what? Uh, on offerings and that's where we're told that freely we have received let this freely do what give and it's upon us to decide thank you amen amen and as we as we move forward i'm i'm looking at in terms of an act of worship then is offering part of worship and, and and the question around i know in deuteronomy and especially um 16 16 the bible says that they shall not appear before the lord empty-handed um so in this case and i'll, I'll go to you, uh, elder Perry, is is offering a part of worship and how should we treat it even as we are teaching our children as the act of worship thank you so much i think that is very key that is very key even i remember in our second study we found out that there is a very big correlation in faithfulness even in tithe giving and worship and the true state of our hearts mm. we saw in the case example of king ezekiah that when they realized the way their waywardness the ezekiah instituted reformation and the people gave tithe so it was seen that when there is a true revival it is reflected on how people worship their god it is reflected that truly the areas which had been neglected in areas of worship will now be revived people will come to god to express their appreciation to him both in tithing and in offerings note as you know, God is not bribing us with the promise of blessing. And I think that one should also be understood. Because sometimes I think we might be giving tithe because we feel that now this is the only condition to tap on the promises God has given us. But <clears throat> we learned last week that even when Jacob gave the promise in the book of Genesis chapter 28 that if you keep me and I go and I come back to my fatherland, I will give tithe. Not because it was not it was not just trying to promise God some token, but it was operating on the account of the promises of God. So now, <clears throat> any true revival in the true godliness and revival will always be seen in the, our aspect of worship, and worship is always majorly in four aspects. We have seen both in the Old Testament and in the Old, New Testament. One, it will be seen in the study and the preaching of the Word of God. Where worship must involve the study and preaching of the Word of God, sharing the Word of God. Worship must be seen in prayer. <clears throat> must be seen in prayer. Because how do we worship God? We worship God through preaching and sharing his word. We worship God through prayer. We worship God through music. Where we give, we magnify his name of who he is and what he has done to us. And again, we express our worship and gratitude to God through tithes and offerings. So, when there is true godliness and reformation, it will be seen in all those aspects of worship. It will be seen in our study. That is why when we are saying, as we, we, we have been saying, that we need to go back to the altar. What are we saying? We are saying it is in the altar where we have been worshipping God. We have a communion with God. How? Through prayer. To, through the study of his word. You see, it is 
enumerating on the aspects of worship another one through the music we praise him as we do that and then we express it in faithfulness through tithe and offering so when we understand that even offering tithing and offering is a form of worship it will dictate even how we are giving that offering malachi said in chapter 1 verse 7 <clears throat> that you give me animals which are lame which are boils and then it asks try that with your governor last week we looked here and we, we were reflecting upon recently when the president had gone to southern nyanza he was given a very big motor mm. <laughs> very big motor big one yeah. and then a very big bowl mm -hmm. then we we're asking if that is just a president mm. can be given that you see the type of person now what about if you're worshiping the living god mm. it dictates that even our worship through giving will be the choicest hard from our heart the choicest from our uh, gardens from our trees from our increment from our uh, 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 blessings which god has given us they are uh, the water is the will give god the best even our own lives we will give the best to god in our strength i think let me just add i read something on cancers to the church it was saying god is faithful yes he will be is ready to forgive and to cleanse as first john says but the message was to young people and it was saying how beautiful it would it have been if you gave god the best of your strength when you are still youthful because god can still forgive you even at deathbed but how sweet would it have been if we gave god the best of our physical youthful strength we go mountains for the name of god so what i'm saying worship at uh, offerings worship through offering uh, is giving offerings is also a form of worship and since it is a form of worship to the living god the creator of the heavens and earth it dictates which kind of offering are we going to give and how are we going to give it thank you powerful elder manyara i wonder as a parent because we need to transfer this this knowledge also to our children how how how, how are you ensuring you're teaching your children because um I struggle with how do do I give my children money in the money so that they can come and give to the Lord. I've always not been sure that that's the most effective way of teaching them um, this whole offering as a sign of, sac of of worship. How could you share your experience with us and we can learn from you? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I thank God because uh, when I became the first parent, my firstborn, when he was five years old, he asked me a question on something he had observed for a long time. He asked me a question, Dad, why should we always take money to church every time we go there? <laughs> <laughs> he realized, yes, money is being taken. Yes. <laughs> why must we take it every time we go to, mm. to church? Mm. Then I realized now he is old enough for me to teach him mm. about tithes and offerings and giving to God. Mm -hmm. I, I told him, eh, every time we go visiting friends or relatives, you have seen us carrying some uh, packet of flour, mm -hmm. some fruits. Why do we do that? It is part and parcel of the visit. Mm -hmm. You cannot walk to someone's house. This someone prepares a meal for you, gives you, and then you, you left nothing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I told him that when we go before God, we must not go empty-handed because we are going before him to receive. Then, how can we not take something for God? Because he's so precious. We are going to use our mouths to praise him. We are going to engage our minds. What about our pockets? So we must go in totality because everything on earth belongs to god as we are told in psalms 24 verse 1. Mm -hmm. so even when you look at this um the three uh piper passages here on that tuesday 
Chronicles, First Chronicles 1629, uh, Psalms 96, 8 and 9. Uh, Psalms 116, 16 to 18. When you read these verses, it is amazing that there is no worship that is complete without a sacrifice or giving. And that's where you see even when we go for visitations, there must be always a fruit basket. And how do we appreciate God? It is through our giving. We have already seen that on Sunday. So, uh, offerings are an integral it's not part it's an integral part of worship and without it then it's not complete mm -hmm. thank you let me just add something sister Mercy, which you had asked that uh, now that we have online and all that how do we teach the young ones I want you to look at it this way. Somebody may say, yeah, like, that is a good question. That um, what the Bible says, that you should not come before me without, uh, with the empty handed. Mm -hmm. Somebody may reason that was in the analog era. <laughs> now that we are in the technological era, mm -hmm. why should we carry something? Maybe it can be, uh, it can, uh, 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 when we carry money, it can propagate corona, diseases like corona. <laughs> but yes. the point I want, I would say, this is my personal one. When you go, I, uh, last year I went for a rambe at home, church fun, uh, fundraiser, and I've seen it many a times. When you say, even in a fundraiser, that uh, Sister Mercy has also given us 20,000 through M-Pesa, and then Elder Manyara has given us 20,000, and then he starts counting. One, two, which one appears <laughs> to make impact? The it is the cash. Mm. So, to me, this is what I look at it. I can comfortably give through cash, even through, through online. But I've made it a point even to my children to imprint upon them the information, the knowledge at this stage that they need to go before God with or something. They do not go before God empty-handed until I would love them to, it to sink in their minds. Because if it is through M-Pesa, they may not know. They may think it is that video games they play it in, uh, uh, using the tablet. So I've noted that because the circumstance may differ, if it is to imprint a biblical principle, if it is the actual one which is going to help imprint that biblical principle, our purpose let it be the analog one. With, but until they, they shall have grown to learn that, okay, even if I give it through, uh, uh, tele, tele, uh, through telco, through the mobile m money and all that, then it is still okay. Then that is okay. But at that stage, when they need to grasp the biblical principle, then I would rather go the analog. The same even with the Bible. Mm -hmm. We now have the Bible online. We have the songbook online, but I've realized to make impact, then I would rather go the analog way so that the biblical principle thinks that it is the written word that still holds. Of course, then a time will come when they will realize I can get my Bible online, but the first principle, the basic principles we say in engineering first principles 101 have been inculcated okay thank you very much i just want to add uh, he has uh, he has answered the part of the question i didn't answer but i just want to add this eh? i give both through online and fiscal and uh, when i get my salary actually tithe i usually pay online and uh, part of the offering but now because god has not limited me on how much i should give in offerings eh? yes. every sabbath uh if i didn't cut the envelopes home i pick the envelopes at the entrance and i place money in every offering for every family member Amen. and in fact <clears throat> Uh, when the time for offering comes, if I've not given them the envelopes, they will come for them. Mm. <laughs> because they know they must do what? Yes. Give something to God 
as an act of worship. So we can encourage church members that even as we have these options, we still need to teach, especially our children, on the act of worship through giving. Because we may not give them our phones <laughs> to give in the money and give. Eh? But that fiscal aspect, I, I, I thank Elder Pedro for bringing it out. Mm. It, it is very, very, very important. Some of us may think, I have just given uh, on behalf of the whole family. But still, each family member needs to worship God at individual level. Amen. Thank you. Amen. That's really powerful. And for me, I think that would be a takeaway for me. Because then I realized that the other time my son, my teenage son challenged me and said, Mommy, when do you ever give? And I said, I give immediately I get paid. I transfer my money by electronic payment. And so he said, ah, okay, so how much do you give? Because you see, he's not able now to see the breakdown. So, you know, he's, he's, he really would want to say, so how much do you get paid? So how much of that is your tithe? Do you give faithfully? <laughs> and, but now, actually, I will pick that as a, a, as a take, a take home. Mm -hmm. Because then it, it's easier to do it electronically, definitely. Yeah. Because you want to be able to be the first, you know, the first transaction that you do. Mm -hmm upon pay but I, I think I'd like to borrow that one of ensuring that you have an offering every Sabbath mm -hmm. and especially around camp meeting because that's the other thing I've always wondered because I've given from the beginning of the month you know like if the camp meeting is in August I have given in July at the end of July you've said I've given money for camp meeting I have allocated my camp meeting offering my camp meeting um, you know my tithe and, and the breakdown mm -hmm. I have given that but the question is we are also told do not come before the Lord empty-handed so I, I take that, you know, for me, I'd like to take that as a takeaway home and a lesson from this lesson. So the question then is, um, uh, Elder Manyara, does God take note of our offerings? God <clears throat> takes note of every action mm. that we do. Mm. In fact, Jesus, uh, in the book of Matthew chapter 12, verse 41 to 44, yeah. Uh, he took note of the offering that the widow gave. Mm. Actually, they are called two mites. Yes. Actually, the lesson was saying two copper coins. And you know, um, many people were giving out of their ab abundance. Mm. And they wanted to show that they are doing what? Giving. They are giving. They have given. They want to be seen that they have what? Given. But this lady realizing the little she had. And she felt like this might be. Too, people may think this might be too little for what? For God. But in her heart. She had surrendered to God and said. This is my gift for God. Amen. Yeah. In fact, Ellen White says, Our heart went with our gift. Its value was estimated not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that had promoted Amen. the deed. Amen. It is not people seeing what we are giving. Okay, before the advent of the electronic transfer, uh, how were we giving the offering? Mm. You, you remember when we were growing up, eh? you have to fold your what? Mm. Nobody should see. Remember, it was always emphasized. Mm. Your right hand should not know what is in the, what? <laughs> in the left hand. Yeah. Yes. Only God should see what you have given. Mm. Because it is God who sees the heart mm. and the motive for what? For giving. For giving. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, <clears throat> um, this lady, he gave so little, two mites. Mm -hmm. Now, if you go to the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, what do we find there? We find a, a devout man called Cornelius. And the Bible says, in verse 2 to 4, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. 
Yeah. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? He's calling an angel, Lord. Yeah? Because this man was faithful to God. And he said unto him, this is the message that the angel delivered. Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. So whether we are giving much or little, God takes note of our offerings, especially given out of an honest and faithful heart. You have seen the the widow giving so little, and actually she she, she was even uh, very careful and cautious on how to give, so that the people don't see how much she she gave. Only God should see that, and we have seen Cornelius also giving. So God takes note of our offerings. So there is no action that God does not take note of. And it, the reason why God takes note of this is because of the blessings he gives us. Amen. Thank you. Elder Perry, I'm wondering in terms of, um, I found that very powerful actually. You know, your prayers and your arms have come as a memorial before God. That was very, very profound for me. And, and I'm wondering in terms of when we give, because we've, we've looked back in the you know, different days and we're talking about the motivation of giving. The Lord sees the gift, but he also sees the motive. Yeah, And I'm wondering in terms of, we know people who are givers, very generous givers. They're not necessarily Christians. They may not even be children who know God, but they give. They give towards the poor. They give towards the work of God. You know, as long as you ask, they give. I'm wondering, do those gifts appear before the Lord as a memorial as well? Or is there a condition here only for the children of God? Uh, thank you, uh, Sister Mercy. God keeps the records. Mm. There is a song which we love to sing in the choir, that my Lord keeps the records. And we know the Bible also records God keep the records with the three books, the book of life, the book of remembrance, and the book of records. Mm. In the same chapter of Malachi, chapter 3, the chapter of giving uh, tithe, chapter 3, verse 14, uh, from verse 13 going downwards, it says, you have said, it is useless to serve God. What profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked as mourners before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the proud blessed. For those who do wicked, wickedness are raised up. They even tempt God and go free. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another and the Lord listened and had them so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the lord and who meditate on his name they shall be mine says the lord of hosts on the day that i make them my jewels and i will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him the point is god keeps the records of good things and bad things and then as you asked a question which is also loaded what about those who are not children of God per se, as Christians? Uh, the messenger to the remnant, Ellen G. White, notes in many occasions, counsels on stewardship and a lot. All the wealth belong to God. And all the people are children of God. And she counsels that a lot of effort should be made to reach them with the message. So that when they realize the love of God they become hands of God through their means because you know what it is because of the providences of God sometimes courtesy of the children of God you and I they get collateral benefit you know sometimes many people the world enjoys a lot of benefits courtesy of the children of God, converted children of God. You may be living in a, a flat, but you, a lot of tranquility is enjoyed in that 
due to the collateral benefit because of the children of God. All these people with means should be reached so that to realize that whatever they have, they are keeping them for the master. So that when we reach them with the message, a chord in their hearts will be touched and then they will learn that they should come, become hands of God. Amen. Okay, I just want to add on that question, you know, uh, you have challenged me. The many times I have been touched that someone who does not even come to church is more kind, more generous, and even more concerned than me who comes where? Mm -hmm. To church. And uh, <clears throat> this reminds me of the book of Acts chapter 17 verse 30. In times of ignorance. God winked at. God winked at. But we are told to do what? To repent when we come to the knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, God does not ignore those who are outside the church. Mm -hmm. He recognizes. There is children. I now want to remind you of the story of the Good Samaritan. Who was a Good Samaritan? Was he a Christian? Mm -hmm. He wasn't. Mm -hmm. Jesus gave that illustration mm -hmm. to show that those who are in church can ignore to do the acts of mercy mm -hmm. they're supposed to be doing. But the children of the world will do, and still God will do what? Recognize that. So, those who are outside, who do acts of mercy, God also, also recognizes them. Amen. Thank you. And, and, and I see in the, in the lesson here, towards the end, there's a quote from Luke, 20, uh, Luke 10, 27. The Bible says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And, 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 and he says, in reference to Cornelius, he says, this first part revealed, is revealed in prayer in terms of loving the Lord your God. is revealed in his prayer. When we are told mm -hmm. your prayers and your arms have come as a memorial before God. So in this loving the Lord your God with all your heart and mind, that was revealed in his, his prayer. And the second one was in the arm giving. This one, which was to love his neighbor as himself. Yes. So when you look at Cornelius, you see a man, a man who really, to the best of his knowledge, was a man who loved God and loved men. Huh? And as we, as we move forward in terms of, so we said there is giving, um, and sometimes uh, the structuring of our giving, sometimes it's very clear, you know, it's very structured. We, we, have, uh, we have an offering that we need to give, it's in little things. I have, I have read and met people who give sacrificially. And this is what the lesson today is talking about in the Thursday part, special projects or big jag giving. You know, when you hear of somebody who's actually given up their land, you know, I love mission. You know, my family and I really do love mission. And every, every, once, every time there's a mission, we, we have gone out. And I have seen, I am, I am challenged every time we go, you know, and you find someone who says, I'm giving you three acres of my land. For the church of God to be built. And I'm wondering, have I ever gotten to that point where I have a big jug giving? You know? Or do I limit myself, you know, to 5,000 here? And I feel like I've really done the Lord a favor when I'm giving, you know, um, 5,000 here, 20,000, 50,000. But there's someone who is giving land worth a few million. Eh? And they give sacrificially for the Lord. I'm wondering, Elder O'Pere, our experiences around this big jar giving, this sacrificial giving. And, and, and you know, like what the Lord looks at, even when we look at the story of Mary in the house of Simon, when she comes and she pours perfume which was worth a year's worth of wages. Have we reached to that point where we have given to the Lord sacrificially? Uh, thank you uh, so much. I think uh, this is a wake-up call that um, we can give the obligated tithe of 10 percent we can also remain remain with the 90 percent which we can also give you give according to the measure of the faith and ability but we are also reminded that uh, we are not limited to that we can still give sacrificially like elder had quoted the macedonians mm. they gave much more beyond what then that, that means they sacrificed so there are some truly some times when just the ordinary giving may not achieve it. We must go out of our way. Just like we go out for, you know, sometimes I ask myself the simplest question, maths of class five, if and therefore. Mm. If I can do this to a friend, mm. therefore, 
Why can't I do it for God? Because, my friend, my, my dear, you can go out of your way for a friend and even go take a loan for your friend. But when it comes to the course of God, we put a lot of mathematics, derivations, calculus to see if it is going to work. While if it is of a friend, if and therefore works very well. So this one is an, a two testament, like the case of Mary. And it was also in response of what God had done to her. So to whom much is forgiven, much will be given. So, and that is the same kind of a thing that Mary's uh, uh, gift was beyond because if she remembered what God had done to her, and this is also a wake-up call to us that sometimes, I saw even when we were championing, I think in New Life has a lot of history. Some of us were grafted. We were not there yet. It was being given. But at least we have seen. I remember when the flying marine machine was being bought, how people would go out of their way. It would, it would be said, men, each month maybe give 10,000. But men would come and multiply that one by magnification factor or even 100 times. And they would give. That is what we call big jar giving. In response to how much more God has given us. And you know, we cannot outdo God in giving. We cannot outdo God. Because God gave us all that heaven had. So we cannot outdo God, even with that. But still, we, it is a show of how much God has done to us. So it is encouraged. It is there. My dear, you can get a windfall. Why don't you have a big... Uh, uh, let me give you uh, one time I was, was seconded to my uh, current place of work and we worked for a whole year with the former salary at the Ministry of Roads then after some time a year our salaries were adjusted and backdated my dear that is the time I saw one M plus mm. getting into the account <laughs> that when which you, you go with an ATM you put an ATM machine, a card you punch it to the maximum <laughs> what it can be withdrawn you go out and still make a phone call, hello, while the machine is still counting. Mm. That is a windfall. Mm. When such, you, you can be moved and say, truly I did not deserve this. Mm. God, I will give mm. according, in response, commensurate mm. of the, what you've done to me. Thank you. I'm wondering, in terms of, and, and we give the badain on, you know, sometimes we forget that really this which we have, those things that we call our own, you know, possessions and things that we have, because sometimes if you look at how much, um, how much you have in terms, you've accumulated in terms of wealth and land and I wonder where will we go with these things when all is said and done. I know we're keeping them for our children, but sometimes the work of God is suffering and Mercy has accumulated tracks and tracks of land in plots in different places, really. But it also talks about, it shows the condition of our heart, our relationship with God, and also our relationship with money, Elder. Does it not? It is how I relate with money depending on who is the leader of the other or possessions it's beyond money so it's money and possessions and things it is my relationship with those things and how i relate those things with god i don't know what your experience is elder whether your own or or you've heard of someone giving sacrificially i don't know if there's any experience that you may have that you can share yeah there, there are a number of experiences <clears throat> but i just want to start it with uh this someone that was preached by pastor Anyona hmm. somewhere in 2020 around February he amazed us he was telling us what we possess in this world yeah what we can call our own he told us <clears throat> you are going to your house you are going to take uh, dinner and now comes to the time you are going to sleep Will you enter the bed with your brother? Mm. <laughs> no. Your house? No. Your shoes? No. Probably that night dress or pajama. Mm. He said that's what you own. 
then all the others they don't belong to you so from that what do i learn all these things we possess belong to god and many times we have looked at what is in the bank account do we remember that we own property in terms of land buildings and other things the big jar mm. and most of the time even when we are told to give you are looking at what do you have in your pocket or what do you have in the what mm. in the bank we forget the pieces of land the ones you have said some people see it is not about the money that i can give to god i have a piece of land mm. let me donate three acres of what mm -hmm. three acres of land in fact if you look at uh, Barnabas, mm. there is something that is said about him in the book of Acts chapter 4, verse 37. Having land, sold it, and brought the money, mm -hmm. laid it at the apostles' feet. Mm. And then you remember, <clears throat> yeah, immediately after that verse, <laughs> <laughs> we see, others who do not dip their hands in the big jar for God. They dip in the smaller one. Ananas and Sapphira. They just sell the land because they have seen others also sell the land but they are not willing to surrender everything. So, our possessions, the relationship we have with our possessions and our relationship to God determines where we dip our hands but if we have a good relationship with god we can dip our hands in the big jar that's where we take from that which we give to god but the question is many times is the church prepared for what we're giving from the big jar? i have two illustrations there's a young man the year 2015, I was a speaker in a youth seminar. And um, I remember talking about giving. A young man uh, <coughs> told me that he had promised God that if he gives him a job, he will give the first two month salary to the church. Of course, he did not have an understanding on the systems of giving in the church. He accumulated a two-month salary. After the second month, after he had gotten a job, he carried all the money, went to the pastor's office, and the pastor chased him away. <laughs> yeah. You can't give everything else, you're going to survive. He said, I promise God, but the pastor refused. He went to the church elders. They also refused. Then now this reminds me of also another story I was told. About this man who was giving to the church. And he gave a whole year salary. And then the people were giving pledges. And he pledged a whole year salary. Then when the elders were going through the pledges. They realized Elder Opere has given a Salary. salary they start getting worried eh? they called him to ask him um, please what did you write in your pledge he said if it is reading a whole year's what salary then that is the correct information I wrote mm. the elders were confused so they called the wife because they were wondering <laughs> how is he going to survive <laughs> yeah. the wife was shocked he went and talked with the husband and they said that yes but that, that's my pledge that's what i pledged they went home the church confused uh the, the wife confused the following day was going to work and uh, i think there was something like a raffle he bought a raffle ticket and he won a contract of collecting litter in a town and when he won that contract, he hired 
a truck that was to, used to do, to do that work. Interestingly, the income we was getting from that contract in a week was equivalent to our whole year salary. Amen. So the question is this. We can talk about the big jar. Sometimes as a church, are we prepared? So, as church members, let's dip in the big jar. As a church, let's also be prepared when our members bless us from the big jar. Let's not complain like Judas. Yes? And others in Simon's house. Thank you. Amen, amen. We're coming very close to our conclusion, and I wanted us to look at what the lesson was looking at on Friday as we come to purely the summary, and I'll give each one of you, you know, your, your final comments. And we've been told that the heavenly record of remembrance also notes the financial faithfulness of God's family, of God's family members. The recording angels makes a faithful record of every offering dedicated to God and put into the treasury, and also of the final result of the means thus bestowed the eyes of god takes cognizance of every farting uh, farting devoted to his cause and of the willingness and reluctance of the giver the motive in giving is also chronicled those self-sacrificing consecrated ones will render back to god the things that are his as he requires of them will be rewarded according to their works even though the means that's consecrated is misapplied and I want us to keep a note on that because we'll come back to that so that it does not accomplish the object for which the donor had in view the glory of God and the salvation of souls and those those who made the sacrifice in sincerity of soul with an eye single to the glory of God will not lose their record and that comes from E.G. White testimony to the churches volume 2 page 518 that is really powerful that there is an angel of God who is making a record daily of of our faithfulness you know of our offering of everything we have dedicated to god but i want us to think about this part that actually says that even if in my giving the purpose for which i had given is not accomplished because maybe you know is misapplied but i had consecrated it the lord says i because i had a single purpose which was towards the glory of god i will not lose my reward my offering will still come before God in memorial. I'm wondering, Elder Opere, what would be your thoughts be towards that? So in terms of faithfulness, but also in terms of that statement around misapplied. And how, how then would we deal with something like that? Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we, had lo- we had mentioned something like that last week, that where the storehouse is. Mm. And we realized the storehouse is the house of God, as Malachi 3 had said. Yes. And some people would say the managers at the storehouse may not be uh, faithful, faithful. Mm-hmm. like the sons of Eli, is it the sons of Phineas and uh, and uh, the, the brother were not faithful mm-hmm. in the work of the temple but we realize that uh, we better be faithful mm-hmm. and let the managers discharge their duties faithfully mm-hmm. and what this uh, inspiration is saying let us do up our honest part mm-hmm. if the managers are not faithful in theirs to us, God will account us faithful mm-hmm. for the intentions and the motives for which we had given mm-hmm. for his cause. Mm-hmm. And then the other person who had failed also to discharge his or her duty faithfully will also be held mm-hmm. accountable. Mm-hmm. I think this one dispels the thought which has been there that, ah, uh, those pastors cannot go and eat my money. Mm-hmm. Me, I'll just search for a children's home somewhere and I take my tithe there. However noble the, 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 the act appears to be, it cannot be a substitute for being faithful to God in tithing and in offering. We need to distinguish and not substitute or divert what is consecrated to God for another duty, which also is good, but it is not. God is concerned. If it were so, fire would have been fire. He would have not penalized the people who brought strange fire. God is keen with the process and what he says. Mm-hmm. So I would encourage all of us not to be discouraged. Let us do our honest part and faithfully discharge it. And also ask the church, in addition to what Elder said, that sometimes people of means get discouraged because he imagines that if I give a tithe of one million, People will start asking, hey, how much does do I earn? 
So it has made many people of means, instead of dipping in the big, the, the big jar, mm. they now give trickling in the church. They give just a portion just to appear average. And then there are many ways. Let us also grow. There are many ways. If You should not fear. If it is so, get the details of the union, the conference, uh, where you can pay. But as a church, as you said, we need also to grow and appreciate those with means which God has brought amidst, our, amidst us. Thank Amen. you. Elder Manyara, what are your thoughts? Ah, it's amazing. Um, if you look at um, a number of individuals, especially those who have left our church, mm -hmm. they normally accuse our church leaders of some misappropriating tithes and offerings. And they say now they're separating so that they can give their tithe to be used specifically for God. Mm. I can say confidently here now, <clears throat> there's one group in Africa. I don't want to say which country. They normally send their tithe and offerings to a personal account of a self-proclaimed leader. Mm. And they indicate that before you give the offering, you must call before you send what? The offering. But they do not realize that, <clears throat> yes, we do not have perfect leaders. All of us are sinners in need of what's what? God's grace. So that is why Ellen White is saying that we will not lose our reward. Mm -hmm. So let's not hesitate to give. Because we fear it will be misappropriated. Let's give. God takes note of the offerings as we have read. And there is also something eh, on that part of Friday. God desires people to pray and to plan for the advancement of his work. Mm. But like Cornelius, we are to unite praying pray with giving. Mm -hmm. And we mentioned this last week. <clears throat> that... Before you even give, commit that tithe and offering to God that it can go for the cause of God. And in any case, something happens. God has noted that you are not just giving. It's not a question of uh, f just deeds, but faith also comes in. God does not give, demand that we just give the money. It is not the money that is interested in. Yeah? He's interested in us. We give ourselves first before what? Before giving. And uh, there's something, uh, sister, you pointed out. What was noted first? The prayers. Mm. And then the alms. Mm. So let us be faithful. In our giving we can only be held accountable on our part as church members ours is to give leaders will be held accountable for for responsibility it was that used for the purpose for which it was given amen. thank you very much amen i will give us our closing remarks as we come to the end but i wanted to to just read that final quote in the friday part that says while we pray, faith without works is dead, and without a living faith, it is impossible to, to please God. While we pray, we are to give all we possibly can, both our labor and our means for the fulfillment of our prayers. If we act out our faith, we shall not be forgotten by God. He marks every deed of love and self-denial. He will open ways whereby we may show our faith by our works. That's a quote from uh, Ellen White, Atlantic Union. Glina, June 17, 1903. And I thank God because he is not an unjust God to forget your labor of love. Whether it is in, 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 in your works, whether it is in your giving, the Lord is a faithful God. And he will not forget that which you have given towards him. And that's why we are being told he, he marks, he remembers. There's an angel who is keeping a record of all these things. So as we give our final remarks, I don't know, actually I'll start with you, Elder Jerry, just to give us our final remarks as we come to the end of our lesson this morning. Thank you, sister. <clears throat> uh, I, I, I will want to tell you that uh, 
when I looked at the title of this lesson. Uh, in my mind, it was like the usual stewardship. But amazingly, I am learning. Up to where we are right now, <clears throat> it is better to give than to receive. And what I've noted in uh, the why it's better to give is because you create room for those blessings that are coming from heaven. The ones Elder Pera has been saying that the blessings will overtake us. So it's my encouragement to all of us that let us give and give and give and give. Thank you. Amen. Elder Pera. Uh, thank you so much. I think it is important uh, to realize that as we give, as the, the, our, uh, the, the topic was stating that um, giving for offerings for Christ, mm -hmm. for Jesus, I think it is important to realize that as we give, that is a, a way in which God wants to heal us from the same problem of greed and gluttony. We learned it even the weeks ago that when God gives us, He said we should not worry. He will take care of it. He need God is working in us. Giving, worshiping God through giving is a way God is molding our characters to after divine similitude to be ready to take Him by His word, to be faithful, to be weaned from gluttony and greed that we think our lives only depends on all that we own. No. God is teaching us to trust Him, to test Him with our lives and everything that we own. And is faithful to go by what He says. For God means what He says, and He says what He means. Thank you. Amen. My dear viewers, indeed, what shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. That was our memory verse this morning. Psalms 116 verse 12 to 14. Indeed, there is nothing that you and I can ever do to, to repay the Lord for all that he has done. He has, he we give because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us. I pray that the Lord will put it in your heart to remember that this giving is as a response of the love of God that we can never really outgive God. So I pray that this week and in the next year to come, the Lord will teach us how to give and to give from a heart that has already received. May the Lord bless you even as you go forth into this Sabbath day and into the week to come. Next week we're looking at dealing with debt. Are you in debt? Why are you in debt? And how does the Lord bring you to a point where you should get out of debt? Because a debtor we are, you know, like if you owe, then you are a slave to the person that you owe. And I pray to God that this, as we prepare the next week and the next lesson, that we will meet then for another beautiful lesson. So God bless you, my dear brothers. May the Lord watch over us this week, even as we move on to study his word. Amen. Elder Opera, if you can pray to close the lesson. Our Father and our God, we thank you so much for speaking to us. We thank you for teaching us that we worship you also through giving. But Lord, before we give, we need to have a relationship with you. We pray that, Lord, you may continue to teach us and, Lord, to transform us. That, Lord, we realize that we need to have a good a relationship with you as we, before we give. So that, Lord, when we give, it is a response of the love we have for you, which you have demonstrated through the death of Jesus Christ. Teach us. Strengthen us in areas where we have been weak. Strengthen our faith, for we are weak. Lord, give us the we thank you and adore you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.